I'm sure many of us here can look back on the difficult and hard times in our lives and we can trace how God was able to use those hardships to grow and shape us. It's a comfort to know that God can bring fruit out of the most difficult times in our lives. Let us be reminded today that a life of staying connected to Jesus doesn't mean that we will experience a life free of suffering and pain. Being in the vine doesn't mean that we're promised a life of comfort, but because we are in the vine, we will never not be connected to Jesus himself. Hey everyone, my name is Anya and I'm the worship and technical associate here at CA Church. Welcome to CA Church Online. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from Pastor John as he continues in our I Am series, Jesus in His Own Words. So let's open the Word of God together. Over the last few weeks, we've been exploring the I am statements of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of John. As Pastor Sam said at the beginning of our series, we wanna know who Jesus is. We wanna follow and pursue the real Jesus, the true Jesus, not one of our own making. So each week, we've been going straight to the source. These statements that we've been looking at are Jesus's own words about who he is. And so today, we're coming to the seventh and final I am statement. And I've just got to say, I feel like this one is jam-packed with glory and goodness. You know when you go to a buffet and there's usually one or two good items at the end and they fill you up on bread and pasta at the beginning so you don't eat too much beef and crab legs? Well, there's no filler in Jesus' words today in John 15. No, not a bread roll to be found here. This is all lobster and steak. Yes, it's good. It's rich, it's beautiful, it's profound. There are some life-shaping words from Jesus, our treasure. Before we hear these words together, I wanna to give us some context for what's going on in the life of Jesus. Our words today are from the night before Jesus is about to be betrayed and killed. He's with his disciples and sharing with them some of his last and most important teaching. Knowing that he will not be physically present with them forever, Jesus is laying down a vision of what it looks like to follow him into the future. Now, we don't know exactly where Jesus and the disciples were when he spoke these words, but I like to imagine that it was late at night. The city of Jerusalem was still. And as they were making their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, perhaps they saw a beautiful grapevine lit up in the moonlight or took a moment to pause by the temple and saw the golden grapevine that stood at the entrance to the sanctuary of the temple. Wherever it happened, Jesus leans in close with his disciples and says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. 
These things I command you so that you will love one another. Let's pray. Lord, as we unpack these words today, would you speak to us? Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are right with us wherever we are at this moment. Your presence is here. And I pray that you would illuminate these words to us. You would open them up that we might see truth. Jesus, we want to know you. We want to see you. We want to understand what it means to abide in you. So would you lead us? Would you teach us? Would you draw us into deeper relationship with you through your living word today, we pray. Amen. Jesus begins, I am the true vine. And in verse 5, again says, I am the vine and you are the branches. I don't think many of us here in the lower mainland are overly familiar with viticulture, which is the cultivation and harvesting of grapes. But the image here is parallel to that of the trunk of a tree and its branches. The branches of a tree draw all of their life, strength and nutrients from being connected to the trunk. Jesus is painting a vivid picture here of what it means to be human that we are branches and it's through our constant connection to the life-giving vine of Jesus himself that we draw all that we need to flourish and grow. And he's pretty straight up about it. In verse four, he says, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So Jesus is crystal clear. This is non-negotiable stuff. He doesn't leave room for if, ands, and buts. If we want to live a fruitful life, we must remain connected to the vine, who is Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus emphasizes this need to stay connected again and again. I'd imagine that as you heard and read the words of Jesus today, the word abide stuck out to you. That's because Jesus mentions it 11 times. Now, this isn't really a word that we use a lot nowadays. Now, many translations translate this word remain. Theologian Dale Bruner explains that this verb, translated abide or remain, can also be translated as be at home with. So abide in Jesus, remain in Jesus, be at home with Jesus. What does this look like? How do we abide in the vine? How do we remain in Jesus? Today, we're going to explore three aspects of abiding. Abiding by faith, abiding in relationship, and abiding with fruit. Now we have to start by understanding something essential about what it means to abide in Jesus. Abiding isn't something that we do for God, but rather believing, trusting, and resting in what he has done for us. Now, let me say that again. Abiding isn't something that we do for God, but rather believing, trusting, and resting in what he has done for us. Look at what 1 John 4 says about abiding. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Look, I've got some good news for you today. If you've put your trust in Jesus, if you're looking to him as Lord and Savior, you are already abiding. Because to abide in Jesus is to be united with him. And this is a work of God's grace for all who put their trust in him. Look at what Jesus says to the disciples in verse three. Already you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. He's saying to them, you've heard what I've told you about who I am and you've believed it. In other words, disciples, you are in the vine because you believe in me, that I am the son of God, that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I think he's saying this to them because there's about to be a whole lot of discussion about fruitfulness. And they, like us, attempted to believe that it's our good works, our good fruit, which somehow makes us clean, makes us worthy, that we could somehow do enough stuff that's good for Jesus to pick us to be in his vine team. But friends, this is false. None of us are in the vine, that is, united with Jesus because of what we bring to the table. All of us have sinned. All of us fall short. No, we're in the vine because of God's grace. The Apostle Paul lays it out this way in Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised up with him, seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. To abide in Jesus is to be united with Jesus. This is something that God does for us through the death and resurrection of Jesus, and we receive it as a gift by faith. The imagery Jesus uses of the vine actually helps frame this whole reality. You see, when Jesus declares that he is the true vine, he's drawing from Old Testament imagery associated with the people of Israel. 
In the Old Testament, one of the most common pictures used to describe God's people, the nation of Israel, is that of them being a vine. God calls them a vine. The central idea is that Israel were intended and chosen to be God's people on the earth through which his blessing would be shared with the world. But it didn't go so well. Almost every time the vine is mentioned in regards to Israel, it's in the negative. The Bible's full of moments where it says, look, Israel, you're the vine, but you haven't borne any fruit. They couldn't get the job done. They kept failing. And so the symbol of the vine for Israel and the people of God was associated with failure and all that hadn't been accomplished. And so when Jesus comes in with this beautiful statement and says, I'm the true vine, it's as if he's saying, I am all that Israel could not be. I am the true Israel that Israel could never be. I can do what they can't. It's a gospel statement from Jesus. You guys couldn't do it, so I'm coming to redeem and fulfill and offer new hope and a new way forward. When Jesus says he's the true vine, it's him shouting, don't worry, I've got this and I've got you. He's offering a new way to be fruitful by putting our faith and trust in him, the one who could do what we never could do. We abide, we remain, we're connected to Jesus by continually putting our trust in him, by looking to the one who says, I've got this and I've got you. Jesus has done all that's required for us to abide and we trust in him through faith. It's his gift. I love how one pastor I listened to put it. He said, if you understand the true meaning of abiding in Christ, it actually moves you away from doing something towards a place of rest, trusting that he's the one who's done what needs to be done. We have to start here. Otherwise, this can quickly become a burden and a heavy weight to us to have to ask, us, ask ourselves every day, am I abiding? Am I doing enough? I think Tuesday evening, I was definitely abiding, but today, I'm not so sure about it. No, when Jesus says, abide in me, it's our invitation to trust that he is who he says he is and to receive the forgiveness of our sins, to be welcomed into God's family, to experience new and ongoing life, all through faith in the one who was faithful when none of us ever could be. We abide in Jesus by believing and trusting in him and ongoing looking to Jesus, confessing that he's the son of God, we're never going to graduate from our need to remind ourselves that our salvation, our ongoing relationship with God, are gifts of his grace. He did the work and we receive it by faith. And so to remain in Jesus is to stay attached to Jesus by faith. You know what this means? All are welcome. Who gets to abide? Anyone who looks to the sun. Anyone who recognizes their great need for a savior. No matter where you've been, you can abide. You can be at home with Jesus. And this is his precious gift to us, not a response to anything that we bring to the table. We abide by faith. So that's the first aspect of abiding, abiding by faith. Now let's look at abiding in relationship. There's a dangerous idea that can sometimes creep into the way we think about our relationship with God. It's the idea that the Christian life is all about a singular decision, boom. I've said a sinner's prayer, now that's it. I'm saved from the bad place, I'm gonna keep on going with my life. Like following Jesus is about getting some hellfire insurance. I said a prayer, I'm good with the big man, now leave me alone and let me live my life. But here's the thing, we're not simply saved from something, we're saved to something and saved for something because God has taken care of our sin, which separated us from him. We now get to enjoy God. We get to experience real ongoing relationship with Jesus himself. Jesus says something astounding in verse 15. Listen to this. No longer do I call you servants for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. Jesus calls you and me friend, not a hired servant, but friend. God doesn't just tolerate us. He created us to have actual friendship with him. And this involves spending real time in relationship with him, spending actual time friendship with God. Look at this invitation from Jesus in verse nine. As the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. This is wild to hear. The love that God the father, the creator of the universe has for his son, we're talking a Trinity level love. Jesus has this love for us and we're invited to abide, to remain, to make our home in this love. This is a beautiful vision of the Christian life here. Jesus loves us. His love for us is perfect and unfailing. And so we're invited to orient our life around receiving and basking in this love. Jesus is talking about an ongoing and active friendship, spending intentional, set apart time simply being with him. As I was preparing for this sermon, 
thinking about this invitation from Jesus to abide in his love, I had two contrasting rooms in my head, the basement and the solarium. I remember living in a basement suite which basically had no windows. So much so, especially in winter, I would sometimes have no idea what time of the day it was. Especially when I was studying, literally no idea without checking the clock. Contrast this with the solarium. A solarium is a purpose-built room designed to let in as much sunlight as possible. I just came back from spending some time in the UK and one of the images that stuck in my mind is my great uncle sitting in his solarium. It's a room in the garden built on a rotating disc so that the whole thing can move to face the sun. My uncle is literally spending his evenings pivoting this building to enjoy as much sunlight as possible, literally orienting his position to bask in as much of the warmth of the sun as he can. I think it's a picture of what Jesus is saying here. Look, we're not created for basement living, hiding away in the dark with the occasional reflected of sun cracking through. No, we're built for the solarium to bask in the love of Christ. That same love that the father has for his son, to have the warmth of that love shine on our lives as we orient and turn ourselves towards him through intentional time spent with God. As human beings, we aren't built for the basement. We're built for the solarium. He wants us to know this love, to spend time with us, have friendship with us. It's what we were made for, friends. So what does it actually look like? What does solarium living look like? Well, there's a number of ways that God has given us to move that solarium of our lives to face him, to abide in his love and experience friendship with him. These are often called spiritual disciplines. But within the context of this passage, I think it would be helpful to call them pathways of abiding, ways that God has designed for us to encounter him, to spend time in friendship with him and to receive his love. Jesus actually mentions a couple of them here in this passage. In verse seven, he says, there's a necessity of having his word abide in us. Friends, God has given us his written word as a way for us to abide in his love, to enjoy friendship with him. Can I encourage you to view Bible reading in this way, not as a dry and dusty obligation, but as an invitation by Jesus himself to abide in his love and experience friendship. He also mentions prayer, time spent coming before God with our requests and posturing ourselves in times of quiet to hear from him. There are are many others, fasting, serving, Sabbath rest. God has also given us ways of abiding in his love together with other followers of Jesus, ways of corporately turning that solarium together. We witness baptisms, we get to partake in the Lord's Supper, we get to hear the word of God being preached, we get to worship and fellowship together and also pray with one another. These are all ways that God has given us to abide in relationship with him, to bask in his love and experience friendship. For me, personal times of praise are absolutely vital moments in my week. I love taking my lunch break to get away, get on the piano and just sing my heart out to God. In those moments, God's presence, his Holy Spirit is is with me to reveal the love of God to me and to stir my affections for Jesus. Let's look at the way that Jesus lived. He modeled this life of abiding. He didn't just have a theoretical relationship with the Father. It wasn't a contract. He modeled a life of prioritizing intentional, set apart time in relationship with his Father. In the Gospels, we see Jesus getting up early, withdrawing to spend time alone with his heavenly Father, praying, bringing his requests before his Father, sitting in quiet and listening. He oriented his life around abiding in his Father's love. But we so often don't approach our relationship with God in this way. It's easy for it to stay theoretical. Let me illustrate with an example of an earthly friendship. One of my good friends is named Evan. And let me tell you, I love that this is true. I love that Evan's my friend. You know what? I could think about the fact that Evan is my friend every single day. I could even write songs and poems about how great it is that Evan's my friend. You know what? I might be so excited one day, I actually head out into the street and I just start telling people how amazing it is that Evan's my friend. And I could do all of this without actually spending a single moment of my life actually with my friend Evan. You get where I'm going with this. Jesus invites us to enjoy ongoing friendship with him, actual time enjoying his presence, abiding in his love. I wanna encourage you about turning the solarium of your life towards the love of God in order to abide in his love, to experience friendship with the lover of your soul. So we've looked at abiding by faith. We've looked, in, we've looked at abiding in relationship. Now let us look at abiding with fruit. Now Jesus makes it really clear in this passage what will happen in our lives if we abide in him. 
When we abide, remain, make our home in Jesus by putting our faith and trust in him, the one who could do what we never could, when we expose our lives to the warmth of Jesus' unfailing love for us, he says that we will bear fruit. Look at verse 5. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Be encouraged, friends. God is the one who is at work to bear much fruit in us. We're called to continue to put our faith and trust in him. And all the while, God is at work within us to bear his fruit in us and through us. Now, what kind of fruit are we talking about here? The fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These things are the character of Jesus himself. And so as we stay connected to Jesus by believing and trusting in him, and as our lives are exposed to his love, God's spirit is at work to shape and conform us to become like Jesus, to have the heart and mind of Christ, to live and to love like Jesus. In Acts 4, there's a moment where the crowd witnesses the boldness of Peter and John, two of Jesus' closest followers. And the crowd came to this amazing conclusion. Based on what they were witnessing, they proclaimed, these men have been with Jesus. As we remain connected to Jesus, he changes us. You can't get close to him without him transforming you from the inside out. Now, I just love spending time with older Christians who've been walking with Jesus for decades. You can see the reality of what Jesus is saying here displayed in their lives. That as they can have continued to believe and trust in him, as they prioritize a life of friendship with God, abiding in his love, the Spirit of God has been at work in them to transform them, to reflect the very heart and character of Jesus. I think of a man from a church I used to attend called Al. And Al would literally, under his breath, just be breathing out the words, precious Jesus, precious Jesus, as he walked around. His life was characterized by great faith in Jesus and prioritizing time in friendship with God. And the fruit that God produced in his life was plain for all to see. He was a man who lived and loved like Jesus. Now Jesus also shares another way that God bears fruit in our life. Look again with me at verses one and two. He says, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. There's a man on my street in Pitt Meadows named Dennis. And Dennis spends literally hours, sometimes the entire day working on his yard out front. And it's stunning. I'm talking crazy beautiful flowers and, and foliage everywhere. In the summer, it's exceptional. And I remember coming home one day and all of the foliage and flowers were suddenly gone and everything was stripped back and it was bare. And it was pretty disappointing to see. Oh man, it looked like it had been ruined. But the reality is that he was preparing it for even greater things to come next season. His garden had to be pruned to prepare it for greater growth and greater maturity next year. And Jesus is telling us that God the Father is at work in the difficult and often painful moments of our lives to prune us in order that we would bear even more fruit. This is something that the Apostle Paul often speaks of in his writing. He says in Romans 5, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I'm sure many of us here can look back on the difficult and hard times in our lives and we can trace how God was able to use those hardships to grow and shape us. It's a comfort to know that God can bring fruit out of the most difficult times in our lives. Let us be reminded today that a life of staying connected to Jesus doesn't mean that we will experience a life free of suffering and pain. Being in the vine doesn't mean that we're promised a life of comfort, but because we are in the vine, we will never not be connected to Jesus himself. He's always right there with us and the sustaining power of his love flowing into us will hold us fast. Finally, when it comes to abiding with fruit, I want us to see that God uses the fruit that comes from abiding with him to draw others into relationship with himself. God's work to bear fruit in our lives is about more than just us. Let's look at verse nine again. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. 
As we abide in Jesus, as we hold on to him, continuing a life of putting our faith and trust in him, as we orient our lives around receiving his love and enjoying friendship with him, God is at work to shape in us a sacrificial love for others. We're called to pour out the love that we have received to those around us. To abide in Jesus is to soak and bask in the solarium of God's love and then pour it out sacrificially on others. God is ready and waiting to grow his fruit in us. He's longing to shape us to be a people that reflect his love to the world, that show others what he's like. Have you ever had a moment when your hands were freezing cold and then someone else with warm hands comes and puts their hand on yours and instantly you feel the comfort and the relief of that warmth radiating through them to you? This is the picture of a life of abiding, warming ourselves by the fire of God's love and then bringing that warmth, bringing that love to others. The fruit that God bears in us, radiating off us so that others may come to experience God's love for them through us. I have a simple question for us today, friends. Is there anyone in your life right now whose hands need warming? Perhaps you could ask Jesus where he may be directing you to go. And so, three aspects of abiding. Abiding by faith. We believe and trust that Jesus has done what we never could do. We abide in the vine by being united with Jesus through his work on our behalf. To abide is to continue to believe in Jesus, trust in Jesus, that he is who he says he is abiding in relationship. We're invited by Jesus who calls us friends to orient our lives around spending time receiving his love for us, turning the solarium of our lives towards him through intentional time and practices. And thirdly, abiding with fruit. As we stay connected to him and expose our lives to him, God is at work by his spirit to bear fruit in us, to shape us to be a people that look and love like Jesus, that carry the warmth of his love to a cold and dying world that needs the light of the world. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From apart, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you are the true vine. Our life can be so confusing sometimes and all of us are tempted to attach ourselves to different vines, whether it be a career, whether it be a relationship, whether it be the approval of others. Lord, there are so many places we look to for nutrients and sustenance, but today we just confess it is you alone that have the words of life. So God, I pray for anyone who might be listening to these words, who is far from you, would they come back? If there are people who are hiding rather than abiding because they are somehow fearful of what you'll think of where they've been in life, I pray would today be a day they return to you, they look to you with eyes of faith, a heart of repentance, turning from their sin, running into your loving embrace, that they would once again know what it means to abide in your love. So God, would you richly pour out your love on us as we look to you, the one who is worthy of all praise. God, thank you so much. I pray that the warmth of your love would radiate on each and every person listening to this today. That all of us, Lord Jesus, would seek to turn our lives to face you and to receive all that you have for us. Thank you, God, that we can experience friendship with you. What an amazing thing that anyone today can call you friend by putting their faith and trust in you, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you are the true vine. In your name we pray, amen. You are the king who came from glory to restore my broken heart now i'm your bride i'm your beloved i don't deserve it, but you gave me life i'm thankful for your mercy i'm humbled by your love Thankful for the promise that you'll always be enough For all that you've done for me and all that is to come Thank you, Jesus You are my hope, you are my fire
your table where I am welcome just as I come I'm thankful for your mercy I'm humbled by your love thankful for the promise that you'll always be enough for all that you've done for me and all that Jesus, I am overcome. Your banner over me is love. Jesus, I am overcome. Your banner over me is love. Jesus, I am overcome. Your banner. tuning in this weekend. As always, please consider giving it a like and subscribing as it helps other people see this. Hi, I'm Hal, one of the elders here at CA Church. Since Pastor Mark and Pastor Diane made their retirement announcement a few months ago, people have been asking, are we planning some events to celebrate their 21 years of service? The answer is yes. We're currently planning and discussing dates and a timeline and all the different ways we will be thanking Mark and Diane with various celebration events. And these will happen later in the fall. So check your emails from CA Church and be listening for dates and times so you can be involved in this. Now, on behalf of the CA Church elders, I want to personally say Thank you. We have appreciated the prayers and input from our staff and congregation during this process of finding a new lead pastor for our church. On August the 7th, we shared that we are not just looking for a good leader, we are looking for the right leader. Using the pastor profile that was created with the help of our staff and congregation, the elders interviewed Pastor Sam Romine and his wife, Jora Lee. The elders, as well as Pastor Sam and Pastor Jora Lee, then took some time to reflect on and pray about this decision. The elders of CA Church are excited to announce that we have unanimously recommended to our district superintendent our offer for Pastor Sam Romine to be the next lead pastor at CA Church. And Pastor Sam has accepted our offer. Our Canadian Pacific District Superintendent, Mark Peters, says that he is delighted to appoint Pastor Sam to this position. We have also received resignation letters from Pastor Mark and Pastor Diane. Their last day at CA Church 
will be December 31st, 2022. Details about a commissioning service for Pastor Sam and the start date for him in this role, as well as a celebration service and love offering for Pastor Mark and Pastor Diane will be announced in the fall. The elders want to recognize that the coming of Pastor Mark and Pastor Diane 21 years ago to CA Church, and now the coming of Pastor Sam as lead pastor are gifts of God for our CA Church. We are thankful to God for bringing these leaders to us and thankful to them for their work. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.12 that we should acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard because of their love for you. Over the next while, we invite you to send your memories and notes of encouragement to Pastor Mark and Diane, as well as to officially welcome Pastor Sam to his role as lead pastor. There's a link on the CA Church website, cachurch.ca, on the homepage. Just look for the big button that says Leadership Succession, and you can send your comments there. The elders will continue to keep you informed this fall. Thank you again for your prayers. We look forward to joining with you in celebrating Pastor Mark and Pastor Diane and welcoming Pastor Sam. Thank you.